So I left at about 4.30 in the morning. And I fell asleep at the wheel and drove off the road and hit a large cedar tree and uh, told my car. A trucker saw me run off the road and his wife happened to be a nurse. Saved my life. Jason Cowper's crash happened February 6, 2016, just before his 30th birthday. In the weeks after he came out of his induced coma, he started noticing memory problems. So whenever I'd take a shower, I'd wash my hair, and then I'd shave or do whatever, and I'd wash my hair again. And I'd notice that I was washing my hair again because you can feel it, right? And that never happened in the past. It was a lonely feeling for Jason. It's hard to talk to friends about brain damage because they only know what they've seen on ER in First 48. In television and movies, often people with a brain injury can't remember who they are or where they're from. That is the exact opposite of what happens to most people with brain injuries. So for most people with brain injuries, after the moment of the injury event, the problem becomes learning new things. But the past is, for the most part, relatively easily recalled. The 1997 Bulls, I know all about that team. Scottie Pippen's point average when Michael Jordan retired, I know all about it. It's the new stuff that's more difficult to remember. Mama's boo. Tanya Howell was hit by a car after a fender bender on a Houston interstate on Christmas Eve 2004. Like a lot of people who experience a severe traumatic brain injury, she remembers nothing about the crash itself. Well, the craziest thing that I, I find just off the wall about the brain injury is a lot of things like, say, current to today, I had struggled with. But if you ask me about my childhood, I could go down the line and list it out for you, which is just the craziest thing. And I never understood, she's like, but you know, it's the after, not the before. Learning things since the injury will probably always be harder for her than it would have been. One of the most stressful things I will say out of all of this is I could be gone to a place 10, 15, it don't matter how many times I've gone. And I still will have to look in my phone and be like, okay, I've gone to this doctor. I've been gone 15 years. And I still couldn't for the life of me tell you how to get there. So it's really common uh, for people that have had significant traumatic brain injuries to have difficulty learning and remembering new information. Um, and while we know that people do get better over time, it's not uncommon for people to have residual impairments with their memory. And those residual impairments can interfere um, with their social functioning, with their ability to get back to work, um, and, and participate in other things that are important for them. Tanya was frightened by the effects of the crash on her memory. I was scared, because I'm like, oh my God, your brain is a, a, a vital, important part of you. you. If I can't remember stuff, then what am I supposed to do? Oh my God, that means I'm gonna have to depend on somebody, and that's not in my nature, being dependent. I like being independent. So I was like, oh my God, what am I gonna do? Before her injury, Tanya owned and operated a 24-hour daycare, helping working families and being the boss. She lost her business and a lot of her independence because of her memory challenges. Jason felt a similar hit to his self-worth. It's difficult to live through an experience and you feel like you're okay because you're walking and you're talking and you're not sleeping anymore and things are fine. And then day-to-day -day things like brushing your teeth are difficult. I think what turned me around the most was talking to these therapists and meeting with neurologists and rehabilitation specialists and, and they're like friends and they would tell me, you're not the same. Something bad happened. And so, you know, you gotta live with it. So they kind of helped me see that I really needed help. Most people who experience memory problems after TBI do find it enormously frustrating. Uh, the good news is that with some rehabilitation and some coaching, they can come up with strategies that actually can not only improve their memory function, but reduce the daily frustrations, irritability, and anger, and anxiety that comes as a result of having them. 
Memory strategies can be very simple, like always parking your car in the same spot, using an alarm to remind you to take medication, or taking notes during appointments. And for those who are comfortable with technology, smartphones can help a lot. So can you give me an example of how you use your phone and your alarm? Jason struggled with being late and forgetting events. He needed more than just the name of an event listed on a calendar. So for example, this appointment yesterday, I would check it. I would check my calendar to make sure that I was going to be here on time, right? Mm -hmm. So I looked at what time it was, what time I needed to be here, what time I needed to wake up. Mm -hmm. And then I set my schedule to make sure that I woke up, mm -hmm. I was showered, mm -hmm. I was on the road, mm -hmm. parked and ready to go. And I had all that scheduled in my phone, right? So is there a regular time of day each day that you tend to review what you're going to have to do the next day? All the time. Talking about it makes me want to check my phone right now, right? <laughs> Dr. Angel Sander is co-director at the Texas TBI model system of TIER, one of 16 traumatic brain injury model system centers funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research. Model system centers conduct research and provide innovative treatments for people with brain injury. One of the mistakes that people generally make if they're teaching someone memory strategies after traumatic brain injury is failing to consider that the memory problem itself will get in the way of them learning the strategy. So repetition is really important. It's very important to go over the strategy and not just assume that someone is going to pick up on it the first couple of times they see it or hear it. It's also really important to not assume that the person will learn it in one setting and be able to apply it in another setting. One of the memory studies that we did here uh, uh, was a study where we would develop the strategies with the person with injury in the setting where they would be using the strategy. Tanya received multiple home visits from neuropsychologist Dr. Allison Clark over the course of two months. This week, Tanya's Hi, mother is visiting from Detroit, Hi. and she walks Dr. Clark back to Tanya's room, which is where Tanya says she feels most comfortable. Tanya, she's here. Hey, Dr. Clark, how you Hi, doing? Hi, Tanya, good to see you. See. I know, how you been? Oh, I've been awesome, awesome. Feeling. One of the memory strategies Tanya uses is simplifying her surroundings. Some people that have um, memory problems after a severe traumatic brain injury, um, they may find that they leave things all over the house and they can't remember where they are and they can't remember where they put them. <laughs> to prevent that, Tanya spends most of her time in her bedroom and keeps all of her most important memory tools there. And at Tanya's request, that's where she and Dr. Clark do their work, testing and tweaking memory strategies together to help Tanya live more independently. She's got reminders about her physical limitations to keep her safe. They've got her smartphone set up to provide reminders about appointments and medications. Tanya is able to live on her own, and she's studying for her master's degree. A second pair of eyes to look at your paper. And together, they figured out a way to help family members deal with Tanya's tendency to repeat herself caused by her brain injury. Instead of everybody always saying, you know, I already heard that. I already heard what you told me. Oh, you told me that already. They wouldn't have to do that. We just made a signal, hold up one finger, and that would let me know that it was something I had already said. Nobody's feelings would be feeling like they're making me feel dumb, and I wouldn't feel like, dang, I'm a broken record. It's that simple little note. was just a quick reminder to flick the channel, change the channel, and go to something else. But new situations can still cause memory problems for Tanya, and today, Dr. Clark is going to help her figure out what went wrong at the veterinarian's office. Tell me what happened with Missy. Took her to the vet, mm -hmm. and because we found out she had allergies, oh. specific kind, I didn't know dogs could get allergies. I didn't either. So she was like, I had to put her on a different type of food diet for me to take and give her a, a cup twice a day is what I thought she said. But what she was saying was take one cup and divide it up into giving it to her half in the morning mm -hmm. and half at night so that mm -hmm. she fell, that she got full, but it's only technically one whole cup in a day. Okay. But I was giving her a cup twice a day. So she was getting double dose. Yes. What did and she Missy do? put on like seven, eight pounds, which hurts her legs trying to walk around a little bit of dog. Mm -hmm. Little simple stuff. You know, the way she, I don't know if it's the way she worded it or just the way I come, I guess I should have asked questions. 
Well, that's a good example of um, you know one of the issues that we were working with of misremembering some details. So you knew you had to give her this new food, but the details of how that food was supposed to be divided up, that's where the error was. That's where the, the memory failure came in. So what do you what do you think you could have done differently? Written it written it down. Written down. Or, what would you have written down? I would have I mean the exact what she told me, or use my phone, the uh, program we got on the phone for the notepad where she would have been talking and it would have recorded it and typed it up so I could have had it to go back and reference to. Tanya has been using her phone to record important details for years, but finding out bad news about a beloved pet was a challenging experience that interfered with her memory strategies. When you, were, when you were at the veterinarian's office, what did, did, you, did, you, did you do any of that, or were you just... I did not. Okay, so you just... I was so excited to find out, okay, this is what's wrong. But I was just like, I could have killed the dog because of the, you know, just a little small thing that I messed up on. right. I know. Dr. Clark still, thinks there know, might also be another it, factor that is typical for many while, people with memory you know, problems after TBI. From listening to her talk, she's, there's still some reluctance to use the strategies. Like she, I feel like she feels like it's some sign of weakness or that it's somehow preventing her recovery. Uh, and so that she just really wants to be able to remember it independently without any type of strategy. But it makes, it makes me feel, I mean, you know how to say, they put that word disability, it makes me feel like I'm totally dependent on it and not like I'm trying to grow in the process. You know, when I learn, I want to, you know, show that I'm showing some improvement, mm -hmm. not like I'm just stuck in this one spot. Mm -hmm. Like with this ones we come up with, I feel like I only have to go back to them if I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. Like well, a safety net. Right. Not like just, I'm totally dependent on it and I can't function without it. Well, you're functioning with it. I would argue What's the difference? Well, I mean, you wear glasses to help you see. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you want to see where you're going. I do. You want to remember important things. Great you're analogy. using you're using your you're using your phone to help you remember things. Okay. So you can so be it's independent. Not a, it's not a weakness. It's not a weakness. Okay. It's just it's it's a it's a device. It's a support that's helping you that's live cool. independently okay. and do the things that you want to do. And I also want to point out that many of us who have never had a brain injury use compensatory devices. You use one? Yes. Now, when it comes to, at first, initially, when it came to them telling me about the strategies, technology, I was like, well, see, to me, it felt like you calling me stupid or slow to have to rely on something to do it, to remember what I'm supposed to do. But then when I start trying to do something on my own without using them, I'm going to set my kitchen on fire because I was still trying to do things on my own, but I forgot one thing while I was doing another. So then I was like, okay, you know what? Stop trying to be big-headed and thinking you can do it and realize I'm a better person for realizing that, hey, things have changed and I need to adjust and adapt or get left behind and suffer consequences. And I'm not about getting left behind and staying stuck. One of the things that we have to help people come to terms with is that using a strategy does not mean that your memory is getting weaker or that you are less of a person than you were before. You're actually helping your memory with every strategy that you use because every time you write something down, you are reinforcing that memory and making it more likely that you're going to remember things and be able to function in your everyday life. If this happened again, what you would do next time? Let's break this down. So you're, when exactly you're going to enter this information into your phone? When I'm being given the information. Good. So what when, I, when I do that, then I can confirm that I'm getting it right before I leave. Good, good. Because what when happens if you wait till you, you do it when you get home? Then I'm going to forget the details and I'll be called. Exactly. So you picked up key thing is, is getting that important information down immediately, right away. Um, and I also said you said something about repeating it back to the doctor. To, to make me. sure that I got it right. Correct. Before I leave. So, so, right, so you just told me uh, what you could have done differently to help you remember those, those important details. So why don't you show me what, exactly what you would do. Okay, Dr. Bradford, to make sure that I'm understanding this correctly, I would give Missy a total of one cup a day, but I'm dividing it up half a cup in the morning at nine and a half a cup in the evening at six o'clock, totaling the one cup. Am I understanding that correctly? That's what I would do. Then to confirm, I would play it back for the doctor. Okay, Dr. Bradford, to make sure that I'm 
One of the problems with brain injury is that it's not an occasional problem, it's an all the time problem. And the very nature of the injury itself and the memory problems makes it difficult to use those strategies effectively. It takes somebody teaching you how to do it and practicing and practicing and practicing in a way that most people, most of us, without a brain injury, don't have to struggle with. For some people, the effect of memory strategies can be improved by medication. Drugs that were developed for conditions like Alzheimer's have shown some promise for people with memory problems after TBI. They don't fix the memory problems, but if you will, they, they put the bumpers up in the gutters of the bowling lane to prevent memory gutter balls and allow people to learn to use their strategies more effectively. These medicines don't work for everyone, and that speaks to the incredible variability in the way people recover from brain injury. After injury, we see those differences play out with some people having had a very severe injury and recovering well, and some people having had what sounds like a less severe injury, but actually not doing nearly as well as the other. Um, it's, an, it's a really interesting area of brain injury research right now, trying to figure out all of those things that either help us heal effectively, to be resilient, or that make us more vulnerable to having problems after injury. Our expectations have to be about you and where you're going, and not about some ideal of how you should do, because it's going to be different for everybody. Right now, the strategies Jason has in place on his smartphone are allowing him to do volunteer work and pursue a new career. He wants to be a financial advisor, and he's studying for his Series 6. And it's hard, but um, what my neurologist told me was learning new things is actually one of the most beneficial things you can do for yourself. So even though it's really hard, it really helps the healing process. So it just takes longer. He's come to terms with using memory strategies in his life. I think at the very beginning, the biggest barriers for using memory strategies was me not wanting to use them. I think that um, some people might call it a crutch, but sometimes you have a busted knee, you know? I think if people can be more independent with their memory, um, that will hopefully give them, you know, greater confidence in themselves. Uh, and encouragement to go out and do more things and try more things and be more independent. Tanya is studying the business of long-term care online at North Central University. I use memory strategies while I'm also studying for my master's degree because otherwise I wouldn't have been able to stay in school this long without using them. Instead of trying to like read the book physically myself because I've learned with the brain injury, I learn better from hearing than I do actually from reading regardless of how many times I do. So um, Dr. Clark showed me how to install a program that will read the, everything to me. And I may still have to listen to it more than once to make sure that I got all the details that I needed to input in the assignment, but it made it way easier to, to grasp it because they don't just give out the degrees, you got to earn them. What we're really trying to do is trying to increase people's independence, increase their, their participation in their community, increase their participation with their friends, and so they know that, that if they do have a memory problem, that there's something that they can do to compensate for that problem so they can still do what they want to do. Tanya was focused on helping people before her injury, and she's hoping her memory strategies and what she's learning in graduate school can help her do that once again by sharing her knowledge about the healthcare system with other people who need it. Yes, you sure can. All you have to do is go through this process, and I can tell them because I've researched it, and I know the details of what you have to go through, so that I not only helped me, I helped somebody else, which is a fulfilling thing. While I can't work, I can help myself and still somebody else, and that's a reward that no dollar bill could ever give you. <laughs> it's a cold She's moment. Oh, Jesus. Write it down in the book. TBI model system centers provide coordinated and multidisciplinary care and conduct research to improve care and outcomes for people with traumatic brain injury. This video is a product of the Model Systems Knowledge Translation Center in collaboration with the Texas TBI model system of Tier Memorial Hermann, funded by the National Institute on Disability, Independent Living, and Rehabilitation Research.
To learn more about the work of the TBI Model System Centers, please visit msktc.org.